the sixth way through the Old Testament. As you're finding that, I want to share a couple praises. We uh, really are thankful for what God did last weekend as close to 40 people were at the marriage retreat. And I want to thank the young adults, some of which served as servant leaders there. Some other young adults, college students, served here by taking some of the kids of some of the couples that went. I love seeing that servant spirit. Leola led her boss to Christ this week. How cool is that? Man, we just celebrate that. That is so exciting. Uh, be praying for the flooding in Louisiana and the uh, earthquake in Italy. Because of our tithing money, we were able to send $1,000 through Samaritan's Purse to help with the Louisiana flood relief, so thankful for that. Uh, the neighborhood outreach that is going on in the neighborhood behind where we live, any new people that move in, we have a team of people taking things, a little care package to them. That has been amazingly blessed uh, this week. Kevin fixed a leak in our roof this week. Thank you, Kevin. So, uh, lots of praises. We just give thanks to God. Yeah. All right. Before we have our scripture reading and prayer, every Sunday morning, I, uh, in coming to church, I stop at the racetrack on 441 in Hog Mountain Road. And there's a buddy there named James. I'm pretty sure he's a believer. And every time I walk in on Sundays, he always says, what you got today? He wants to hear what I'm going to preach on. And several times, I've been able to almost give the, a mini message right there in racetrack to whoever's in line. Uh, and he asked for it, so it's, you know, I, I'm just answering his question. Today, I said, I'm beginning the book of Hosea. Have you ever read that book? And he says, no, I have no clue what it's about. Give me a summary. And I said, God commands a prophet named Hosea to marry a prostitute. And his eyes just went, what are you talking about? And tells him in advance that she is not going to remain faithful to him, but he's to remain faithful to her to demonstrate the undying love of God for us because we are often spiritual harlots. And yet God continues not only to love us, remain faithfully committed to us, but pursue us to come back. And he said, man, you're going to raise some eyebrows today. He goes, I would never want that assignment. That sounds like the worst thing next to Job that God could ever put somebody through. That's the message of this radical book. Let that soak in for a minute. You know, this is another reason. I gave some reasons last week why I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. This is another reason because man in his most advanced creativity would never come up with a story like this, much less to represent the God of the universe. I mean, we could come up with stories where God just strikes us dead for sinning. But this kind of love, the love that, that a husband would have for a woman who is repeatedly unfaithful, but rather than send her away, He welcomes her back. That's the radical love of our God. And the love of God is what can set you free. The Bible says the perfect love cast out all fear. Love can set you free to where you will want to love this God back. You will want to pursue this God with all your heart. That's the love we're going to learn about in the next 12 weeks. So let's stand together as I read. We are going to cover three verses today. Now the rest of this series will not go this slow. Uh, trust me, there will be weeks we cover entire chapters. But today, because I want to give some background and I want to develop things in such a way that we'll just cover verses 1 to 3. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Barai, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom. Some translations use promiscuous. Some use prostitute. Some use sexually immoral. ESV says whoredom. And have children of whoredom for, remember I've said whenever you come to the word for in the Old Testament, put the word because in there. It'll add a lot of meaning. In the Hebrew it's called a key clause. Because the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. 
So he went, and he took Gomer, the daughter of Deblame, and she conceived and bore him a son. God, I pray Ephesians 3, the very, the very prayer Paul prayed for the, the Ephesians, that you would open the eyes of our heart, that we might grasp the height, depth, width, and length of your love, which surpasses knowledge. It, it, it's something so deep and wide and far and everything that it surpasses knowledge. It's, it's not an intellectually grasped thing fully. It's not that that's where it stops. It starts in the mind, but it's got to be a revelation of your love. It surpasses knowledge that we might be filled to the fullness of God. I ask you to answer that prayer today and through this entire series. God, would you set the captives free? Would you save the lost? Would you heal the sick? And would you equip your church to reach the nations for the glory of Jesus? In His name, amen. You may be seated. Now, as we take this journey together, we are going to have some real highs. Some highs of, of revealing and seeing the amazing, enduring, everlasting love of God. But I must say to you that if you read through this book, and I encourage you to be reading it through during the series over and over again, there's also some pretty deep lows. And, and three weeks ago, I had the privilege of going to a person in this church's cabin up in Clayton, Georgia, and spending three days in this book. Just, just devouring it, meditating on it, and studying it, and saying, God, how do you want me to develop this as we study this as a church? And I'm out on this dock, spending time with God, and there was a storm coming, and I had this amazing sight that I took this picture, and at first I took a picture because I thought it was really cool that you've got this storm on the left, and then look right in the middle, blue sky on the right. It was like this amazing contrast. And as soon as I took that picture... It was as if the Holy Spirit said, this is the book of Hosea. There are some real clouds of darkness and sin and judgment. I mean some real clouds. There's some dark days in this book. And then there's also the sunshine and blue clearness of the love of God. Right in the midst of that. And so that's what we're going to see. Beginning in verse 1, you see that he lists a number of kings. And like the book itself, you, you have some good kings and you have some bad kings. It's very interesting. Uzziah was mostly good, but he had a fatal flaw of going into the temple when he shouldn't have. Around 740 B.C. Jotham, he did what was right and did not enter the temple. He learned from his father Uzziah. Ahaz, really bad. Hezekiah, really good. Cleaned up the dirty house that Ahaz left. And Jeroboam 1 and Jeroboam 2, not real good. <laughs> So from these kings, you have this real interesting picture of the whole book. Some good, some bad, some mixture of good and bad. And the question becomes, which kind of person will you be? And it's not so much how you start that counts, it's how you finish that counts. Continuance is the test of reality. Will you finish well? Jesus said when he comes to earth, will he find faith on the earth? Will you be like the parable of the sower and the seeds that sprouts up, all excited, real enthusiastic, but when hardship comes, falls away? And so I think perhaps these kings were given to be a little picture of what we're going to see in this book. Some good, some bad, some mixture of good and bad. And we need to constantly ask ourselves, what kind of follower of Jesus will I be? Furthermore, it provides a historical context to this book. We know some dates because of these kings. And so we learn that Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom. That was the king, that was the, uh, the northern kingdom was what is called Israel. The southern kingdom is what is called Judah. There was a split. And, and, and so Hosea is, the, is, is ministering to the northern kingdom at the same time Isaiah was prophesying in Judah or the southern kingdom. We conclude that his prophetic career went from somewhere around 760 to 710 B.C. And there was so much sin in the land that God brought judgment through Assyria. They were God's vessel of judgment upon His people who were in sin. And so the Assyrian invasion was between 740 and 722, and this will be played out throughout this book. You'll see the Assyrian invasion being talked about. And the fall of Samaria came in 722 B.C. to the Assyrians. 
First point is this. God works in history, and he wants to work in our lives. Just from verse 1, I see that God works in history. God works in space and time and events and people. Somebody said that history is his story. <laughs> God works in history. We saw that last week when we saw how Jesus was revealed from Genesis to Revelation. If you weren't here, that, that message is on our website. We saw how Jesus is literally revealed in every book of the Bible and, ha- and how God is at work throughout history to reveal His Son. And what this shows us, beloved, is that God is not some far removed, up in heaven, unconcerned about the things of the earth, not the clockmaker who sets the clock in motion and takes off running and says, well, I hope you do well. No, He's a God who is personal. He's a God who is powerful. He's a God who is sovereign. He is a God who is loving and He wants a relationship with you. You're created to know Him. You're created to be in an intimate relationship with God Almighty. And just as He's worked in His story and is working in His story now, He wants to work in your life. How do I know? Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. John 10 and 10, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, Jesus said. In Psalm 81, He says, Oh, that my people would but listen to me. Oh, that my people would but come to me. I would feed you with the finest of wheat. God wants to write your history. Are you allowing Him into your life? Are you allowing Him to write your history? Are you welcoming Him to write the script of your book? If not, why not? Who better to entrust your life to than the one who created you, created the world, knows you better than anybody else, and knows the future and is telling you a lot about it in advance? (laughs) You'd be a fool to not give your life to that one. You say, that's a little harsh, David. Well, it's true. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. You see, the best thing to do for yourself, you know, it's our culture now, love yourself. You've got to love yourself, baby. You've got to do what pleases you. It's all about me, 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 me. Okay, love yourself. I'll tell you how to best love yourself. Give your life to your Creator. That's the most loving thing you can do for your life is to give your life to the one who created you because he knows best how your life should be lived. And he holds eternity in his hands. And eternity, beloved, is a lot longer than our 80, 90, 100 years here on earth. I'll tell you what. Number two. In verse 1, we have this interesting phrase, the word of the Lord came to Hosea. You might underline to Hosea. And then in verse 2, the word the Lord first spoke through Hosea. (laughs) What a great picture of the Christian life. He spoke to him and through him. Love God, love others. Know God, make God known. Point number two is this. God speaks and we need to listen. Aren't you glad that our God is and He is not silent? (laughs) He is and He is not silent. He speaks through creation, Romans chapter 1. He speaks through circumstances. He speaks through other people. He's speaking to you right now in this very room. He speaks through His Word. He speaks through His Son. And He speaks in that still, small voice called the Holy Spirit who indwells all believers. And to understand this point, you need to understand a very important theological truth, and that is the indwelling presence of God through the Holy Spirit. When you place your faith in Christ alone for salvation, when you repent of your sin and receive Christ in your life, the Bible says in Ephesians 1 and 13 and Romans 8 and 9 that you are immediately indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The very presence and power and life of God comes to reside within your spirit. And he says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. You can quench that spirit. You can push down that spirit. But if He's there, He's there to stay, and He's always seeking to draw you back when you get out of His will. And it's the Holy Spirit who indwells you that gives you the ability to hear His voice. I'm not talking about an audible voice, though I know some people have heard an audible voice. I've never heard an audible voice. But I know that 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 I've heard God speak to me. 
And it's usually in, in, in a thought, an impression, just something coming to my mind, that, that still small voice, the Bible calls it, where you're just going about your day. And you have that impression, you sense something from the Lord, or you're reading Scripture, and He just causes a verse or a phrase to leap off the page. That's God speaking to you. And He spoke to Hosea, He spoke to these kings, and He speaks to you. Even if you're here today and you've not yet received Christ, He's speaking to you to draw you to Jesus. He's speaking to you, showing you, following Jesus is the best thing you can do in life. And you're hearing His voice right now. You're feeling that stirring in your heart. That's God speaking to you. Aren't you glad that He's a personal God? He speaks, and we need to be listening. We need to have our antenna raised high to tune in to the, to the, to the, to the radio channel of God's Spirit. Oh, that we would live like a sailboat with our sails raised high, just catching that wind when it blows, and being carried along by the Spirit. Galatians 5 says, all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. Now when you listen to God and follow God as Hosea did, you need to be prepared for some interesting things. It's, it, it's, it's not meant to be comfortable and easy and happy-go-lucky all the time. How many know that? Sometimes God will call us to do some challenging things. Number three. God sometimes gives challenging orders, and we need to obey. Put yourself in Hosea's sandals today. Marry a prostitute and remain faithful to her? Ha have children with her? And, and even when she goes after other lovers, I'm to stay faithful? And, and not only that... Go after? Allure? We'll get there. Allure her back? You know, God, I like the, I li I like the message, but, but I don't like the messenger <laughs> that you're calling to do this. Uh, could you choose someone else? Now, Jonah went running against the command of God, and look what happened to him. Hosea obeyed. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen God give some pretty radical jobs to people. <laughs> Abraham was told to offer his son Isaac, the very son of promise, kill him. Stopped at the last minute, but he was about to obey. All right, this is about as radical as they come. Isaiah 20, verses 3 to 5. Look at this verse. The Lord said to Isaiah, as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years. What? As a sign and a portent. That's kind of a prophecy against Egypt and Cush. How'd you like that assignment? You say, God wouldn't do that. He, he did it. <laughs> Ezekiel had to lay on his side for over a year as a sign. Paul went on multiple missionary journeys in obedience to God, and they were not comfortable. Read 2 Corinthians 11 for some details on what he went through. God will go to great lengths to give a message. This Tuesday night, over at the theater down here, there's the movie The Insanity of God about persecution of Christ followers. I encourage you to come out. We're going to take a group. We're going to be there. I think 7 or 7.30, Kristen, do you know? 7.30 at the Ovation Theater. You see, being a Christ follower means that there will be times in our journey when God will call us to do things that are not easy, not pleasant. This is why we need the Holy Spirit living in us to help us pull it off. Because we can't do it on our own strength. What is God calling you to do that perhaps is unpleasant and uncomfortable and hard right now? Some of you maybe here are wrestling with some obedience issues and it's hard. You're not alone. You're not alone. And let me just say this. What God calls, God empowers. And when we obey, He blesses. And He's glorified. And that's what we're here on earth to do. Glorify God. As I think about this point, I think about some of you. I think about the Richardsons. 
preparing to go back to the mission field. I think about Jeremiah Lindsay, preparing to go to the mission field. I think about those that have served in the launch group, those that have been in our DMT groups, that have faithfully, week after week, out doing outreach. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. I think of Andy Hines, who took early retirement to devote his full energy to intercessory prayer. Some of you in taking co classes at the Athens College of Ministry. I think of Marcia and Rick Wilbur, who sacrificed an incredible amount to start the Athens College of Ministry. I think about Jerry Kaiser volunteering here for no pay, working almost full-time, just volunteering as a minister here. And then I, I was heard this week of somebody in this church that in anticipation of our September 11 offering for the chapel, he works partly on commission, and he's committed all his extra commission revenue between now and 9-11 to this offering. And I said, brother, I'm going to pray God bless his socks off you. <laughs> I'm sure that won't be easy. You see, when you realize that God has given his all to us when we don't deserve it, you're motivated to give your all to him who does deserve it. <laughs> when you realize that God has given his all to us when we don't deserve it, you're motivated to give your all to Him who does deserve it. Now look with me again at verse 2. There's a phrase there that really provides a framework for the book. The reason He called Hosea to do this was because the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Mm. The land was full of sin. God, God called Hosea to do this. Gomer was representative of the land, the, the people, and how they had forsaken the Lord, committing great whoredom. And we'll, we'll flesh that out in just a minute. But it just shows that Hosea is ministering during a time of deep darkness. Sin was rampant. Temple prostitution was happening. The spiritual fervor for God was at a low. There was a great inequality between the rich and the poor, and the rich were taking advantage of the poor. We'll see that later in the book. So there's all kinds of sin and evil. Matter of fact, it was J. Sidlow Baxter's commentary. He says, it was the awful last lap of iniquity in Israel's downward drive. Wow. Wow. So much in this book, beloved, that's parallel to America right now. Maybe this week on, in your own time with God, read Matthew 24 and 2 Timothy 3 and see how much it is similar to reading the daily newspaper or listening to the nightly news. Matthew 24, 2 Timothy 3 will rock your socks concerning what we're seeing on, in our nation. Don't read it now. That's your homework. Point number four, God calls us to radical allegiance despite what the culture does. It's easy to be carried along with the tide of the day with the flow of the stream of immorality and selfishness and pride and me, 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 building bigger barns. It's so easy to let your canoe just go right downstream, is it not, with the culture, with the flow of the day. And even what some canoes called the church will say is okay. Well, I know the Bible says that, but, you know, there's ways to interpret that now. And, and we can't really expect people to live that now. This is 2016. I'm not going to even mention the areas I'm thinking of right now, but I bet you can. And so it's easy to be carried along by the tide of immorality and selfishness and pride and materialism. And God calls us to radical allegiance, as He did Hosea in the midst of this ungodly culture. So, 
so many parallels as we march through this book. How do we stay faithful? How do we have this radical allegiance? Beloved, we must be committed to God's Word. We must live a life of prayer. We must be abiding in Him. We must say no to temptation. When we do sin, we must quickly repent. We must be connected with the body of Christ on Sundays and in a small group. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. We must live in accountability. We must speak the truth in love. We must be involved in ministry and serving so that we have a healthy balance of input and output. And we must know the faithful Hosea love of God. Which leads us to the final point. God loves us despite our unfaithfulness. And this love demands a response. He loves us despite our unfaithfulness. And that love demands a response. Now to accurately understand this book, it is important that we understand why God would use this phrase, whoredom, harlotry, prostitution, unfaithfulness, promiscuousness. It basically refers, it doesn't take a sophisticated Hebrew scholar, it's, it refers to someone who is not faithful to their spouse. That's, that's all you need to know. How they live that out, it, it, it may not have been an on-the-corner prostitute like maybe we think of, you know, selling their body to somebody every night. It, it may not have been that. Regardless, it's someone who is not faithful to their marital partner. That's all you need to know. So why would he use this word? Whoredom in the ESV is used eight times in just the first six chapters, three times right here in these three verses. So to properly understand that, it is very crucial that you understand that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God, and this is astounding, <laughs> likens his relationship with us to that of a marriage. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> we would never come up with this. I don't, it, it, no biblical author would ever come up with this on their own. Evidence again that this is God's inspired word. He likens his relationship with us to that of a marriage. He is the groom, we are the bride. Now men, I know this is a little harder for us to grasp, but just make the switch. He's the groom, we're the bride. You say, where is that in the Bible? All right, Old and New Testament. First of all, Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker <laughs> is your husband, the Lord of hosts. A host is a group. Bride is plural. Groom is singular. <laughs> did, did you, do you see what that's saying? Your maker... This is the one who spoke the world into existence. Knows the stars by name. Spoke light into existence. In Job it says, He commands the lightning. Makes the deer be born. Your maker is your husband. He's powerful and he's personal. Come on, Jerry. What do you say? Come on. Jerry's got a husband. And so do you. Your maker is your husband. Isaiah 62, 5. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Terry, where are you? I'll tell you what, Terry stood here three weeks ago. Man, he was rejoicing over his bride. Right, brother? I mean, I almost left out the you shall kiss your bride part. And he starts moving in to Romani. I mean, moving in. Moving in. Oh, I did, oh, yeah, you can kiss your bride. He was going to do it anyway. Whether I gave him permission or not. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Mm. Lord, would you give us a revelation of your love? Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives just as Christ loves the church, gave himself for her. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And then Revelation 21, 9. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The wife of the Lamb. 
So with that in mind, us and God married to go after other things or people or to love something more than God, what would that be like? You're married to God, but you love money or another person or your job or a sports team or a hobby or ministry. What would that be likened to in a marriage? Adultery. Unfaithfulness. Whoredom. Harlotry. You see? This is why the first commandment is you shall have no other gods. This is why Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All. And this is why Matthew 16 and 4, when in rebuking the people, He said, you evil and adulterous generation. And then look at this passage. James 4. You adulterous people. You see, that's giving yourself to something more than to God. Ouch. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's your adulterous relationship. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose, listen to this, that the Scripture says He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us. God is a jealous God. You say, what? I always thought jealousy was something just negative. No. I love my wife, Dee Dee, so much that if another man came on to her and tried to take her affections, you're darn right I'd be jealous. <laughs> and I'd fight for her. How much more God for you? He has a holy jealousy. A holy jealousy. H-O-L-Y and W-H-O-L-L-Y. He has a holy jealousy for you. He longs for intimacy with you so much that if something else is coming in and threatening that, He's jealous because He deserves first place in your life. And He wants your love and your affection and your loyalty and your obedience. This demands a response. This love cannot just be said, well, I get it, but I don't live it. If you don't live it, you don't get it. If you get it, you live it. It demands a response. We love because He first loved us. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love Me, you will obey. Why do I want to please my wife and provide for her? Because I love her. Not, not this dutiful thing. Well, good husbands have to... No! I love her. I want nothing more than intimacy closeness, loyalty, connection in our marriage. God deserves first place in our lives. So in this book of Hosea, just so we're clear, who did the characters represent? Hosea represents God. And Gomer represents God's people. Us. Me. I'm a spiritual harlot sometimes. And yet God still loves me. I go after other lovers sometimes. But God stays faithfully committed to me and to you. We see here the love of God. The amazing and unconditional and enduring love of God. His love and commitment to us is based on who He is and not who we are. It is based on His work at the cross and not ours for Him. It's based on His loyalty and not ours. It is based on His faithfulness and not ours. It is based on His character and not ours. It is an enduring love despite our adultery. He continues to love and stay committed and pursue us even when we are wayward. It's 1 John 4 and 16, God is love. It's 1 John 4 and 10, here is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's Romans 8, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. It's Romans 5 and 8, God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. This is amazing grace. This is amazing love. There's no one who will love you like this. <laughs> 
There's no one who will stay faithful to you like this. No one with you at all times like this. No one who will pursue you like this. There's no one like this you can come to at any time, anywhere, after having done anything. And you know He'll listen, and He'll understand, and He'll love you and forgive you, and work to restore you to where you need to be. And we'll see this over and over in this amazing love story. How's your relationship with God? Have you come to the altar of your heart and said, I do? Or have you just been dating Him, <laughs> but you've yet to come to the altar and say, I do? Terry and Romani weren't married until they said, I do. They're engaged, they dated, they posted all the pictures. But until they said, I do, until death do me part, they were not legally married. And you're not legally married to God until you say, I do, in your heart. Repenting of your sins, receiving Christ, putting Christ, put your full faith and trust in Christ alone for your salvation. Well, I go to church. That doesn't make it I do. <laughs> I've been through confirmation. That doesn't make it I do. I've been baptized. That doesn't make it I do. I give a tithe. Doesn't make it I do. You can't buy your way to God. Come on. You come by faith in Christ alone. Repenting of your sins and saying, God, I have nothing to bring. There's nothing I've done or can do or will do that will ever merit a relationship with you. You've paid it all. You paid my debt. You died in my place for my sin. It's only through the blood of Jesus, only through the sacrifice of Jesus, only by the love of Jesus that I can have a relationship with God. I receive that. God, I receive that. Come into my life and change me from the inside out. At that moment, you're born again. You are married to God. Some of you are married, but you've drifted. You are Gomer. And Satan's been lying to you and telling you because you've done whatever, you're not qualified anymore. And God's saying, you know what? If you'll just come, I'll forgive and I'll restore and we'll move on. Today can be the first day of the rest of your life. <laughs> and that's not just a cool little phrase. It is the truth. It's what grace is all about. Today can be the first day of the rest of your life. Don't let the enemy beat you up for the past. Believe God for the present and the future. So how's your marriage with God? Are you spending time with Him? <laughs> Good marriages are where couples spend time together. Are you connecting? Are you pouring out your heart? Are you seeking Him to know Him better? How is your marriage? With God. Are you forsaking all others? I love that line in, in some, some vows that I've seen. Forsaking all others and cleaving only to you. Love that. And we do that with God. We forsake all others. And we cleave to Him. Do you know His love? God wants to give a revelation to some of you of His amazing love. And as I prayed earlier in Ephesians 3, it's... It's not just something you grasp with your mind. I love that prayer. He says it's a, it, it surpasses knowledge. God, would you open the eyes of our heart that we might see the height, depth, width, and length of your love, which surpasses knowledge. It, it goes beyond the intellect. And so I'm going to lead you in a, in a moment here in a, in, in, closely where I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes and just open your heart to the Lord and see if He might give you something special right here in this room. I believe He wants to reveal. He's been revealing it. Maybe right here. Maybe even already here. I hope so this morning. But oh, that He might give everybody in this body throughout this series a fresh Ephesians 3 revelation of His love that we might be filled to all the fullness of God. Amen? So let's pray. Lord, we thank You for the amazing truths of Your Word. God, this is so radical. <laughs> this is so radical and it's so beautiful. And we're so grateful. God, I pray this good news would spread from this group of people to the nations. And now, Lord, I just ask that you might 
plant into some people's spirit here, especially those that maybe need it the most. Just a fresh revelation of your love, whether it's a vision or a word picture or scripture or just a just some kind of an aha. So as we sit before you quietly now, God, we open ourselves up. And I just pray in this moment of silence that you would be moving through the power of the Spirit to reveal your love to people here right now. Come, Holy Spirit. If you're not certain that you have a relationship with God, I invite you right now to just pray and surrender your life to Christ. Invite Him to come in and take control of your life. The Bible says, All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I pray that in these weeks ahead, even this week specifically, that as your body here this morning gathers, as they spend time with you in the morning or evening or on lunch break, as they get alone with you, I pray that you do some really cool things to reveal this radical love. That we would hear testimonies and breakthroughs and exactly what you, Jesus, said you came to do, set the captives free. I pray for those that are captive to fear, captive to past sins, captive to guilt and shame, captive to, to j just things that have been done to them, uh, abuse and, and all kinds of stuff that just wrecks lives, that you came to set the captives free. You came to forgive and restore and heal and set free. So we just, I just pray that, God, for this body of people today and those hearing on the internet and other places where this will go, that you would use this series, use these truths to set people free for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, and then we'll have our response time. So whoever our microphone guys are today, where are you? If you have a question, raise your hand. Or maybe just something that just happened in this prayer time uh, that you want to just give praise to God for. If God showed you something specifically, share it. That'll encourage us. So raise your hand. The mic will be brought to you. This is a statement that I felt the Lord gave to me. I think even people out in the world, but His children also, we test him by being so bad to make him show us how much he loves us. And we make him strive and jealous because as hurt human beings, there's no way that really, unless you're a Christian and following God's word, that you could truly love. And we're all seeking that ultimate love, that mm. ultimate exception. Mm. And only in Jesus Christ can you find that. Mm.
Pastor David, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you were saying about forsaking others. Um, yeah. Maybe you meant a little bit more like following or giving all to God, but forsake others in the meanwhile. Thanks for asking for clarification. It's forsaking others that should, or anything in our lives that shouldn't have a place there. So forsaking other things that, that are getting first place that God should have first place. So if I realize that I'm materialistic, I would forsake that. That would be an other. I would forsake, um, if I'm a workaholic and I really my job is my God, I would forsake that. It doesn't mean I quit working, but I'd get it in line. I would put Christ back on the throne. I love the old Campus Crusade, Christ on the throne, and other things. I usually use like a wheel where Christ is the center, and the spokes are the things in our lives that should come, into, should come under His Lordship. So my hobbies and my job and my finances, you know, it doesn't mean those are bad, but if they become the center, then it's out of line. And so Christ is the center, and all those other things are spokes that yield to Christ. And that's what sanctification is all about. It's a process. You know, we're constantly seeking to, to have Christ be more Lord of our lives. You know, I don't agree with that phrase. If He's not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. I don't agree with that. That's not, that's not biblically accurate. Who can say He's Lord of all? Sanctification, the process of becoming more like Jesus, the process of becoming more holy, is the process of... Him becoming more Lord of our lives, more master. He's more master of my finances now than he was 20 years ago. I can tell you that. Okay? So, so that's what I mean by forsaking things that are getting that place that only Christ should have. Good question. Romans 13 says that love does no anyone else. And you quoted Jeremiah 29 that said, God has plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Um, I don't understand how there's a compatible with this story because it would seem that anyone who's had their spouse be unfaithful to them is being harmed as well as the children that are born into that situation. Yeah, well, it, it's... it's Love does no harm doesn't mean that love will not take someone through something difficult. The greatest demonstration of love is what Jesus did at the cross. So God, the Father, slew His Son. It was the Father's pleasure to do that, according to Isaiah 53. And so our understanding of love is that love would never do something that would put pain on another. Well, that's not God's view of love. God, here's the best definition of love, in my opinion. Doing that which is the highest good for another, regardless of the cost to self. God did that which was the highest good for us, regardless of the cost to self, which was slay His Son. Because what, what he knew would benefit us the most was that our sins be paid for by him so that we wouldn't have to endure his wrath and judgment. And so when we love, we do what's the highest good of another regardless of the cost of self. Okay, when my son was in rebellion, I let him stay in jail for 30 days. That was the highest good for him. <laughs> and it was costly to me to an extent, but that was because I knew that, that would we believed and it happened that he would be drawn back to, to, to good behavior through that. In the same way that God is taking this as an object lesson. And I believe that He gave Hosea the grace to do that. He knew it would be difficult. Look at what He sovereignly allowed Job to go through. But His grace was sufficient. And we can stand on that. Just like when Paul didn't have the thorn in the flesh removed. If God in His sovereignty allows you to go through something painful, difficult, you can be assured that His grace and His love is sufficient to carry you through that. Furthermore, He will use that difficulty you've been through to make you an amazing wounded healer of others. You'll be able to help others. You'll be able to minister to others. You'll be able to identify with others like no one else because you've been through it. And every time you help another, it will be redeeming to you because you'll say, you know what? I'm so glad I stayed faithful to God in the midst of that. I'm so glad I trusted Him in the midst of that because look at how He's using me now. And that's what God wants His church to be. This, this church to be a group of people who go out and minister in the community even out of our own pain, even out of our own suffering, even out of our own hardship, we can be vessels of grace and love to others. Because our God's love 
will never forsake you. You look at Romans 8, all those things that says nothing can separate us from His love. Look at the list, 31 to 39. It's a list of very hard things. Nakedness, peril, sword. I mean, it's, it's not that, that nothing can separate us and they're all good things. They're all really hard things that will cause us to question His love, which is why we need the truth to assure us that He has not forsaken us. Because Satan will lie and your flesh will rebel and you'll say, well, this, all these bad things are happening because God doesn't love me. That's a lie. But it'll, it'll be the temptation. That's the temptation to believe the lie when you're going through those. So read Romans 8, 31 to 39 today. One more here and then maybe another one over here. And, and then uh, actually worship team, why don't you guys go ahead and come up and get ready. Um, I want to word this very precise. Um, it was just piggybacking on what you said and what the question was. Um, when you're in a relationship with someone, whether it be a friendship, a family member, whatever it is, um, you're constantly sacrificing mm. for that person. Mm. There isn't a day or a moment that goes by where you say, oh, you know what, I'm just going to give up on this person, forget it, mm. you know, it's too hard, it's too difficult. No, you constantly persist regardless of what it is, you know. Um, that's pretty much what it is with God. You know, if you love God as you love your neighbor, your friend, your parent, your husband, your mm. wh whatever person in your life that you love, you constantly sacrifice. So if God is putting yeah, you ma through something, you say, okay, God, I may not like this, but mm. I love you. So yeah. I'm going to choose to do yeah, this for you. Just like you choose to love the person that you have in your life, regardless of how imperfect they are. That's good. Amen. Good word. All right. I really want our response time to be a time where we press into the Lord. We're going to do two songs. We've got time for two songs, so that's cool. Isn't it great to not be pressured for time today? I can't believe I got through all that in 40 minutes. Seriously. So uh, I want our prayer teams to be available along the sides. I know with the potluck lunch, there's a limitation over here, but just find somewhere between those tables to be available. The altar is open if you just want to worship God right here and just pour out your heart and just ask God to give you a fresh revelation. But I really, in these two songs, let's really... You don't feel like you have to sing. It's great if you do. Do it from the heart. But it might just be a time you just let the Lord just, just kind of cover you with His presence. So a lot of freedom here. St kneel, stand, sit, come to the front, go to somebody on the sides for prayer. Let's uh, join together in responding. So stand if you want.